Sal, this is Risto, the friendly Pandunia guru. Pandunia is a simple international language that helps people to cross the language barrier. In this video, I will talk about Pandunia's word order. So, let's begin. Let's start from the basics. Words have to be put into some order in every language. It's because speech is sequential. Words come out from the mouth one after another. They are in order, like beads on a string. And it's not only in speech. Also written words are normally arranged in lines of text. The order of words can be fixed or free. Some languages have so-called free word order. It means that grammatical features like roles of words are coded into words. Even if the word order is grammatically free, there is still a certain normal word order that people expect to hear. For example, the words carry enough grammatical information in the English sentence She sees him. The word she is the subject, the word him is the object because it's in the object form, and the word sees is the verb. So in theory, the order of words could be changed without a change in meaning. We could say, for example, him she sees or sees him she. However, expressions like these are very seldom heard. It's because English has fixed word order. And the normal word order is subject, verb, object. So she sees him. Also, Pandunia has fixed word order. It means that the word order is grammatically important. It conveys grammatical meaning. A change in the word order results in a change in the meaning of the sentence. Pandunia's word order is simple and natural. It is always the same in every type of sentence. There's no complex things like inverted word order in questions. You know, like in English. In English they say in a declarative sentence, he will do it. But when the sentence is interrogative, a question, they will say, will he do it? So the verb moves to the front of the sentence. In English, the word order changes also in content questions, like in a declarative sentence, you would say, she loves it. But if you turn it into a question, you will say, what does she love? The question word and the helping verb move to the front of the sentence. Pantunia doesn't have word order changes like that. The word order is always the same, and that's that. In this presentation, I will go through the main syntactic clause types of Pandunia. They are the predicative clause, the intransitive clause, and the transitive clause. These names are technical, but don't worry, I will explain them in plain words later. These three clause types, or at least the last two of them, exist in all human languages. They are also the most frequent clause types in Pandunia. I will start my presentation from the predicative clause. It's the simplest of all the clause types. The purpose of the predicative clause is to assign some identity or quality to the subject. Here are two examples of predicative clauses. The cat is an animal. This sentence assigns the cat into the category of animals. The man was happy. This sentence assigns the quality of happiness to the man. I have colored the participants, the subject and the predicative, with different colors. The subject is someone or something that the clause is about. Here the subjects are the cat and the man. The predicative predicates or tells some new information about the subject. Here the predicatives tell what the cat is and what the man is. The copula is a verb that couples or joins the subjects and the predicative together. Here is the structure of the predicative clause in Pandunia as a graph. The basic predicative clause patterns are someone is something, someone is some kind of. In short, the subject is what the predicative says. The predicative clause is simple in Pandunia. What is new for English speakers is that the copula verb to be can be left out. It's not necessary in Pandunia. So there are two types of predicative clause, verbal and nominal. The verbal predicative clause uses the copula verb to be. To be is always s in Pandunia. There is only one word form, 
S. Da es Ali. He is Ali. Ali es Guru. Ali is a teacher. Guru es Sen. The teacher is old. Mimen es Pandunia Jen. We are Pandunia people. The nominal predicative clause doesn't have any copula verb. There is no S. There's nothing at all, or maybe just a short pause between the subject and the predicative. This so-called zero copula can be marked with a dash in writing, like I have done in this slide. Da Ali. He is Ali. Ali Guru. Ali is a teacher. Guru Sen. The teacher is old. Mimen Pandunia Jen. We are Pandunia people. The copula verb is necessary in serial verb constructions. There must be s or else the sentence might have a different meaning than intended. Dabil es guru. He can be a teacher. If you would say only Dabil guru, it would mean he can teach. Mimen yao es how. We need to be good. If you would say only Mimen yao how, it would mean we need something good. I will introduce the intransitive clause next. It is another simple clause type in Pandunia. The purpose of the intransitive clause is to express an event where someone does something or where something happens. The intransitive clause contains only one participant, the subject. It is the doer or the experiencer of the event. Intransitive clause does not contain an object. Here are some examples of intransitive clauses. Children run. This sentence tells what the children do. They run. The door opens. This sentence tells what the door does. It opens. The old man dies. This sentence tells what the old man experiences. He dies. As you can see, the actions can be voluntary or involuntary. They are done by the subject or they just happen to the subject. In intransitive clauses, if anyone at all is affected by the event, it is the subject. So the action is directed at the subject. The subject undergoes a change. The change can be a change of state or a change of place. In the sentence, the children run, the subject changes place. In the sentence, the old man dies, the subject changes state from living to dead. Here are some intransitive clauses in Pandunia. I have colored the subjects with orange and the verbs with blue. Bace curse. Children run. Junfem danse. The young woman dances. Senman morte. The old man died. Note that Pandunia verbs don't include tense, so they can express the past and present alike. Therefore, for example, morte can mean both died and dies. So-called intransitive verbs can take a cognate object, whose meaning is very close to the meaning of the verb. For example, the sentence bace curse, the children run, can take an object like long curse, a long run. Bace curse, long curse, the children run a long run. The meaning of the sentence doesn't really change. It is still about an activity and a change of place but structurally it is now a transitive clause. Two more examples. Junfem danse mei danse. The young woman dances a beautiful dance. Sen man morte hau morte. The old man died a good death. Did you notice that the intransitive clause is structurally similar to the nominal predicative clause? The one that had zero copula? That's right, they are similar. Therefore, the sentence sen man morte can mean both the old man died and the old man is dead. But they mean the same thing, don't they? So it's okay that they look the same because they mean the same thing too. One can also use the copula verb and say sen man es morte, the old man is dead. I will close my presentation by talking about the transitive clause. 
It is the most versatile clothes type in Pandunia, and it has many different realizations. Transitive clauses are clauses where the verb has a direct object. A direct object is someone or something that is affected by the verb. The purpose of the transitive clause is to express an event where someone does something to someone or something. The three constituents of the transitive clause are subject, verb and object. They can be ordered in many different ways. In Pandunia, the order is subject, verb, object or SVO in short. This order is one of the most common word orders among world languages. It is the most common word order by number of speakers and the second most common word order by number of languages. Transitive clauses are called transitive because they express an event where some energy transits from the subject to the object. Subject, verb, object is a natural word order because it follows the natural order of the event. The subject is the source of the energy. It sends it through the verb, which transits it to the object. The object receives the energy and is affected by it. Here are some examples of transitive clauses in Pandunia. Gen da pemur, a person strikes the wall. Gen is the subject and mur is the object. Waf jam oste, a dog chews a bone. Waf is the subject and oste is the object. Guru kitabe buke, a teacher writes a book. Guru is the subject and buke is the object. This slide demonstrates that words don't change in Pandunia. Mi porte da, I carry him. Da porte mi, he carries me. The personal pronouns remain unchanged, regardless of whether they are the subject or object of the verb. There is nothing in the words themselves that would indicate their role. In Pandunia, subject and object are syntactic roles that are realized by the word order. There are many languages that work like Pandunia. For example, Chinese, Vietnamese, Thai, Malay, Yoruba and Igbo. Most natural contact languages, that is, Pidgins and Creoles, work like this too. For example, the Haitian Creole and Papiamentu. English, on the other hand, has separate subject and object pronouns. The first person singular subject pronoun is I, and the object pronoun is me. The third person singular subject pronoun is he or she, and the object pronoun is him or her. Many languages differentiate subject and object forms in nouns too, not only in pronouns. Pivot construction is a very important construction in Pandunia. It is used often and for many different purposes. It is a very powerful and versatile syntactic tool. A pivot construction is born when a transitive clause is joined to another clause, and the object of the first clause is the same as the subject of the second clause. They merge together into one, so they become what is called the pivot. The pivot is at the same time the object of the first verb and the subject of the second verb. Let me show an example. There are two transitive clauses at the top that are joined into one pivot construction at the bottom. Mi vide waf. I see the dog. Waf jam oste. The dog chews a bone. The object of the first clause is the dog. The subject of the second clause is the dog. They are the same, so we can combine these clauses into one, and the dog becomes the pivot. Mi vide waf jam oste. It can be expressed in at least two different ways in English. I see the dog chewing a bone, or I see that the dog chews a bone. Here's another example. Again, there are two transitive clauses at the top, and they are joined into one pivot construction at the bottom. The first clause is Guru Ching Schuler. The teacher asks students. The second clause is Schuler Kitabe Letre. The students write a letter. They have the same participant, the students. So that is the pivot. The clauses can be joined into a pivot construction. 
Guru Ching Shuler Kitabe Letre. The teacher asks students to write a letter. Remember what I told about the natural word order and the flow of energy. Energy flows from the most powerful participant to the least powerful participant of the event. This applies to the transitive clause and also to the pivot construction. In both cases, the subject starts the event, the verb or verbs transit the energy forward, and the object receives it at the end. In the typical case, also the pivot transits the energy. In the previous example, the students write the letter because their teacher asks them to do it. So, in a way, they transit the energy or power from the teacher to the act of writing the letter. There's no direct flow of energy in the other example where the subject sees the dog chewing a bone. That's because seeing is not an energetic verb. So in that case the sight transits from the subject to the dog and finally to the bone. Let's look at a bigger picture. The pivot constructions that we just discussed are basically two events or actions in a chain. Only two. In reality, action chains can be much longer. Every cause has an effect which causes another effect, which causes yet another effect, and so on. An action chain describes flow of energy from one participant to another. The chain starts from the most powerful participant, the prime mover, and it ends at the least powerful participant. A typical action chain involves the causer, the agent, the instrument, the patient, and the recipient or benefactor. An action chain is created by joining many transitive clauses, so it is like many pivot constructions in a row. It's possible to express very long action chains in Pandunia. Here's one example. The participants are marked with different colors. Mi Ching tu use chaku kateban don ma. I request you to use a knife to cut bread and give it to mother. Normally we don't want to say the entire action chain. It would be boring. Normally people talk only about those participants that are interesting and newsworthy. So they pick only a few interesting participants from the entire action chain. What's important is that their order stays the same. Energy flows always from the beginning to the end, from the first participant to the last. In this selection, we are interested about the agent, the instrument and the patient, that are involved in the event. Agent is the participant who does the action. Instrument is the tool that transits the action. So it is the pivot. Patient is the participant that undergoes the action. Man uses chaku kate ban. The man uses a knife to cut bread. The man is the agent, the knife is the instrument, and the bread is the patient. Bache jete bol dape gol. The child throws a ball to hit the goal. The child is the agent, the ball is the instrument, and the goal is the patient that is hit. In this selection we are interested about the causer, the agent, and the patient. The agent is the pivot this time. We talked about the first example earlier. Guru Ching Schuler Kitabe Letre. The teacher asks students to write a letter. The teacher is the causer. The students are the instrument and the letter is the patient. Chefe Amir Karer Bine Karekan. The chief orders the workers to build a workshop. The chief is the causer, the workers are the agent and the workshop is the patient. We can describe the same situation also in terms of syntax. The chief is the subject, the workers are the pivot and the workshop is the object. Pandulia, it is possible to leave out participants from pivot constructions under certain conditions. The subject can be left out when it is known without saying, and the first verb is a modal verb. A modal verb indicates a modality such as question, guess, desire, wish, and suggestion. Here's one example, first as the complete construction. Misual tu kitabe letre. I ask, do you write letters? The subject is I, and to ask is a modal verb in Pandunia, so the subject can be left out. The resulting sentence goes like this. Sual tu kitabe letre? Do you write letters? This is a normal way to ask yes or no questions in Pandunia. Coincidentally, it resembles the structure of the corresponding English sentence. 
The only difference is that the sentence starts with a meaningless empty verb in English, do, whereas it starts with a perfectly meaningful verb in Pandunia. Sual means to ask. Of course, a question should include a question word. Sometimes the first two participants can be left out when they are known without saying. It works with requests and orders, when the first person makes the request or orders the second person. In other words, when I request or order you to do something. Here's an example. First, the full sentence. Mi ching tu kitabe letre. I request you to write a letter. I request you. It's obvious who is who, so we don't need to mention it. So let's leave the obvious participants out. Ching kitabe letre. Please, write a letter. This is the normal way to make polite requests in Pandunia. Here we left out always the first participant from the private construction. What if we would let it be there and drop the second participant? Could that happen under any conditions? It is worthwhile to mention the participants only when they add new information to the sentence. It makes sense to say, I want you to write a letter. But would it make sense to say, I want me to write a letter? No. One hears sentences like that only seldom. We tend to express our own actions differently than actions that we want from other people. We don't say, I want that I write, but we say, I want to write. Looks like we don't want to repeat the same subject. Good language is economical. It saves words. The second participant can be left out from the private construction when it is the same as the subject. We don't say, mi yau mi kitabe letre. We say, mi yau kitabe letre. Word by word it is, I want write a letter. It is shorter and more efficient. This structure is called the verb series or the serial verb construction. It is very common in Pandunia. There are similar simple structures in many African and Asian languages. Thank you for watching this presentation about clause types in Pandunia. Now you know how to make many kinds of sentences in Pandunia. Shukre!